In Guatemala, the Supreme Electoral Court ordered hold the suspension of the Semilla movement until the end of the electoral process. In Mexico, the survey to pick the presidential candidate for the ruling National Regeneration Movement concludes this Sunday. And in China, Typhoon Haikyuu made landfall in eastern Taiwan, bringing heavy rains and strong winds, where 4,000 people have been evacuated and thousands more are without power. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from Adresso Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. Guatemala's Supreme Electoral Tribunal stopped on Sunday the resolution of the Citizens' Registry that temporarily suspended the political party Movimiento Semilla. The top electoral authorities' decision was made official by means of a memorandum in which they keep President-elect Arevalo's party alive as long as the electoral process remains in force on October 31st. The revocation of the suspension was signed on Saturday by the five magistrates of the TSC, who on August 28 had dissociated themselves from the decision of the Citizens' Registrar, one of the officials in charge of the entity. The Supreme Electoral Tribunal urged the three powers of the state to continue to watch over the respect for the popular will manifested in the ballot boxes and the integrity, purity and efficiency of the electoral process. Guatemalan social organizations called for a mobilization this Saturday in defense of democracy and the popular will expressed at the polls. Citizens gathered to, to the streets to protest against electoral corruption, which intended through the invalidation of the Semilla movement to disavow Bernardo Arevalo as president-elect. The Guatemalan leader called for national unity to denounce those who refused to accept the electoral results by the suspension of the legal personality of the Semilla movement. The country's social movements demand the resignation of those responsible for the crisis, announced that they will gather signatures to support their petition. Here are your signatures. It is just nothing more than a public call to demand, because we are not going to ask, we are going to demand, as Guatemalans, that the Attorney General of the Prosecutor's Office, Maria Consuelo Torres Argueta, present her resignation. Because we are more than 114,000 Guatemalans demanding it, and more Guatemalans keep joining this petition. Today, Maria Consuelo Torres Argueta, Rafael Curuchiche, Cynthia Monterroro, and Angel Pineda have been declared enemies of the people, enemies of our democracy, and they are the main coup perpetrators and operators of impunity. So thank you, Guatemalans. Here are your names, and together we will continue to demand the resignation of these individuals. In Mexico, the survey to select the presidential candidate for the ruling National Regeneration Movement will conclude this Sunday. Delegates from each of the pre-candidates were present in the communities to conduct polls to define the next presidential candidate for the Morena Party. The polling commission of the political party took more than 12,000 questionnaires during the seven days of the poll. On the other hand, the National Council of the Movement called on the pre-candidates to respect the campaign silence, since the results of the polls will be made public on September 6. In Ecuador, 50 guards and seven police officers were released after being held hostage in several prisons for more than a day. Recent violent acts are the work of criminal gangs with members in prisons in retaliation to efforts by authorities to retake control of prisons by relocating inmates, seizing weapons and other measures. National police commanders said four car bombs and three explosive devices went off across the country in less than 48 hours. The latest explosion happened on a bridge link in two cities in the coastal province of El Oro. Earlier there had been another incident involving a gas tank that exploded under a bridge in Napo province within Ecuador's portion of the Amazon rainforest. Security analyst Daniel Ponton said the chain of events takes place three weeks following the slaying of presidential candidate Fernando Villavicencio and are part of a systematic and clearly planned attack which was evidence the state's inefficiency in preventing violence. Brazil's National Human Rights Council denounced serial abuses in police operation Escudo led by the governor of Sao Paulo. The operation left only three casualties in the coastal city of Garuja. The interviews made by the council even report on extraofficial executions of people who were asleep. 
the preliminary report drafted by the Council and presented on Friday, denounces an imperable lethality rate and demands that the death of civilians in the operation launched by the government of the state of Sao Paulo at the end of July be clarified. The report also denounces that 72% of the detainees are black people, 55% of whom do not have criminal records. In the Caribbean, the word Konuko comes from indigenous languages and names a small parcel of agricultural land. This occasion will bring you the story of Las Conuqueras, a group of women in the Venezuelan state of Carabobo that found in communal agriculture the solutions to their families' hardships, sometimes with their bare hands. Today, they feed, nurture, and give a purpose to their community through self-sustained agriculture with governmental assistance. They are the protagonists of this new episode of the series Venezuela on the Move a production of our colleagues Adriana Sivori and Jesus Romero. Not even the burning sun or the difficulties that may arise can stop their work. They are known as Conuqueras women and they are farmers. I have been working here for 10 years for this community. Apart from that, I also study and work. Within the same agricultural zone, there are people like women who are seamstresses, housewives, who do other activities. We organize ourselves either in the morning or in the afternoon to have the possibility of doing all the activities. Dulby takes care of some of the plots of land in the morning shift. Her son and her daughter-in-law live with her and sometimes help her in the fields. I teach mathematics in a high school, a public high school. We are people with an enormous treasure, but more than that, of producing, of creating, of doing different things, there is something that we should always keep in mind, which is community, and we should never lose that. Everything they grow is for their families and the community itself. To this day, they have produced 40,000 kilograms of food, cereals, fruits, and vegetables. At first, it was hard because we started with our hands, with just our hands. We started using spades and machetes to plant. Then we started to work with institutions. We contacted them and they came and they saw that what we were doing was a reality. Now they receive training, they have instruments and they have been able to build a deep water well for irrigation. And the government has also given land titles to these organized women. In this town, Conoqueras women serve and distribute the food house by house to more than 13,000 people. You can find more episodes of our series Venezuela on the Move in YouTube and other platforms. Let's take a short break, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesur English, where you will find news in different formats, news updates, and much more. All the stories coming up, stay with us. Welcome back from the south. Eruptions of the Ubinas volcano in Peru has made the government extend for 60 days the state of emergency in seven districts of the Moquegua department. Local authorities said the extension will take effect as from September 4th due to what they call a moment of imminent danger. The Geological Mining and Metallurgical Institute reported that the volcanic plume rose some 4,000 meters above the crater and recommended residents to stay more than 4 kilometers away from the area. More than 380 people are still missing after wildfires affected the U.S. state of Hawaii, in which at least 115 people have lost their lives. 
police sources in the Hawaiian island of Maui said the fires left thousands of victims, two thousands of whom still don't have electricity and 10,000 lack telephone and internet service. Local authorities report that the damage caused by the flames is estimated at six billion U.S. dollars. State Governor Josh Green described the forest fires that swept through the coastal city of Lahaina, Maui, on Tuesday as one of the world's natural disasters in the history of the archipelago, as well as one of the deadliest forest catastrophes in the United States in a century. In China, Typhoon Haikyu made landfall in eastern Taiwan on Asian torrential downpours, whipping winds and plunging thousands of households into darkness as the first big storm to directly hit the island in four years. Nearly 4,000 people have been evacuated from high-risk areas. Taiwan's Central Weather Bureau said the typhoon reached the island at 3.40 p.m. local time in coastal Taitung, a mountainous county in lesser populated eastern Taiwan. The number 11 typhoon has gathered speed since Saturday and at 3 p.m. on Sunday has sustained winds of about 154 kilometers per hour. Authorities have reported two minor injuries in Haolian County, a mountainous region where a warning of flash floods was issued after a falling tree hit a car. Ahead of Haiku's arrival, Taiwan authorities suspended air, rail and sea transportation services while urging workers to stay at home. Authorities also suspended academic activities and canceled outdoor events. In this regard, at least 900,000 people and 80,000 fishing boats were moved to a safe location for shelter. Refugees from the Russia-Ukraine conflict in Germany could be returned to their country to join the armed forces. The head of the parliamentary group of Zelensky's party, David Arachamia, raised the idea of extraditing those who left Ukraine due to the armed conflict. Arachamia detailed that at least 160,000 Ukrainians are eligible for combat. Also, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky plans to set up measures against citizens who have avoided military service. The Russian Defense Ministry reported that multiple attempted attacks by Ukrainian maritime drones on the bridge linking eastern Crimea to the Russian mainland were foiled on Friday evening and earlier Saturday morning. The government entity said in a brief statement that the attack was carried out with a semi-submersible unmanned boat, which was promptly detected and destroyed in the Black Sea. The statement adds that three hours later, at around 2.10 a.m. local time, on Saturday, another drone was destroyed in the area and that a third incoming unmanned boat was reportedly neutralized at 2.20 a.m. The Crimean Peninsula, which is home to a key Russian naval base, has been a frequent target of Ukrainian drone and missile attacks. With its fleet reduced to a handful of patrol boats, Kiev has also resorted to attacks on Russian infrastructure and ships by remotely operated vessels. Russia and the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries and Affiliates, OPEC Plus, agreed to maintain the cuts in crude oil production for 2024. The information was released by the Russian Deputy Prime Minister Alexander Novak, who said that the terms will be announced next week. Moscow committed to reduce its crude oil exports by 500,000 barrels per day during the month of August and plans to reduce another 300,000 barrels per day in September. The Prime Minister also left open the possibility of a further cut planned for October. Russia's decision comes amid expectations generated by Saudi Arabia's announcement that it will extend its 1 million barrels per day cut to October. Oil prices soared last month in London to six-month highs above $88 a barrel. In the United Kingdom, around 20,000 railway workers have gone on strike over better salaries. Employees from 14 railway companies said the strike would last 24 hours and that one of these issues leading to it is the working conditions to which they are exposed. The strike affects thousands of passengers all over the country. Over the last few months, other sectors have also gone on strike, like the health sector, demanding proper salaries that would take into account interannual inflation, which has surpassed 6.8%. Telesol English launched its own videos on demand site for you to go and revisit our interviews, top stories, special broadcastings, and more. Just go to the top left corner in our website homepage and click on the video option to access our VOD platform. 
We will now take a final short break. Don't go away. Welcome back from the south. In Israel, more than 150 people were injured during a demonstration of Eritrean migrants in Tel Aviv. In the early hours of Saturday morning, two sides of Eritrean refugees clashed in a demonstration, prompting the Israeli police force to take action to control the situation. The police force reported that they intervened to disperse the protests as they felt threatened by the demonstrators. The director of the Ishilov Medical Center in Tel Aviv said that at least 24 people had been admitted and that seven of them were in serious condition. Syrian military forces counter a terrorist attack by foreign troops in the west of Aleppo province. The army repelled these Sunday attacks by suicide group Omar bin Khattab in towns of Kafir Tal and Kafir Amma. Syrian military responded to the bombing of the city with bombs, artillery and missiles, while Russian aviation destroyed fighting positions in the rear. Extremist gangs have stepped up numerous attacks against military positions and residential areas under the administration of the Syrian government. In Gabon, the ruling military junta announced the reopening of the country's international borders. The Committee for the Transition and Restoration of Institutions approved the measure effective immediately so that the land, sea and air borders would be open as of Saturday, September the 2nd. The committee voted for a reopening of borders in order to preserve respect for the rule of law and good relations with neighboring countries and the rest of the international community, as well as to promote the continuity of the state while showing commitment to fulfill these international obligations. The borders had been closed on August 30th when General Bryce Oligi Ngema overthrew President Ali Bongo, who had been in power for 14 years. In order to ensure continued respect for the rule of law, good relations with our neighbors and with all states around the world, and to promote the continuity of the state while demonstrating our firm determination to honor our international commitments, the Committee for the Transition and Restoration of Institutions has decided to reopen the land, sea and air borders with immediate effect as of this Saturday, September the 2nd, 2023. Large demonstrations are taking place outside a French military base in Niger's capital, Niamey, as pressure mounts on France's ambassador and soldiers to leave the country. According to security personnel, the protest was scheduled to begin at about 3 p.m. local time Saturday, but thousands of demonstrators had already gathered by 10 a.m., taking police and security forces by surprise. Media sources report that demonstrators expressing their frustration for the French presence in the country were beginning to take matters into their own hands. The French ambassador, Sylvain Ide, remained in Niger despite a 48-hour deadline to leave the country more than a week ago, a decision French President Emmanuel Macron, Emmanuel Macron said he applauds. Niger's military government, which seized power on July 26, has accused Macron of using divisive rhetoric in his comments about the coup and seeking to perpetrate France's neo-colonial relationship with its former colony. We are here to express our determination, our commitment and our devotion to getting the French military force and all the military bases on our national territory out of the country. On Saturday, India's first space mission to study the sun departed from the country southeast at 11.50 a.m. local time. The Aditya probe, which means sun in Sanskrit, took off with the launch satellite polar rocket from the Shri Kota Center. According to information from the Indian Research Organization, the probe will orbit the Earth for 16 days, during which time it will gain speed to reach Lagrange, a place between the sun and the Earth. It's estimated that the mission will take about four months before reaching that point, 1.5 million kilometers from our planet. Aditya will study, among other things, the outermost layers of the sun, the photosphere, the chromosphere, and the corona. We are privileged to be, in, be an Indian and witness this kind of uh, developmental activities on the Space uh, Center for India. So thank you very much. Uh, I have lots to say, but uh, right now I'm emotional. One more milestone, just like Chandra and Three, and uh, definitely this is going to set you know the bar high for uh, 
Hey, so. We have come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website, www.dressofenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, X, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Telesor English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.